Hey everybody, this is Kenny. Welcome back to another edition of the Leading from the Middle podcast. This is the podcast for middle managers who want to develop themselves, develop their teams, and improve their results. I got to talk to a phenomenal leader the other day. And wait till you hear her takes on how you can stop things from falling through the cracks, how you can stop from being overwhelmed or frustrated. What do you do when that happens? Wait till you hear her definition on strategy. And then once you define it, how do you go out and actually execute it? How do you become an expert in your field? What are some elements that make you an authority in your field? Well, I got to talk to the growth architect, Beate Chalette, and Beate had so much wisdom to pass on to you. You don't want to miss a second. We talked about these things so much more. Let's get at it. This episode is brought to you by KitCaster. KitCaster books you on top podcasts. How do funded startup founders attract prospects and talent? podcast interviews. How do entrepreneurs with exits find new deals? Podcast interviews. How do C-suite execs differentiate in crowded markets? Podcast interviews. KitCaster books you on top podcasts. Click the link in the show notes for a special offer. Celebrate good conversation. Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to another edition of the Leading from the Middle podcast. This is Kenny. I have a phenomenal phenomenal guest with us this afternoon. I'm going to get right to her because I want you all to hear her backstory and I want to get as much advice from her today for all of you middle managers and leaders out there as I possibly can. So the growth architect, Beate Chalette, has joined me today. Beate, it is so great to have you. How are you? I'm great, Kenny. Thank you so much for having me. I think we're going to have a really interesting conversation today because isn't the middle where everything originates there's no doubt oh absolutely absolutely i should also mention that you are a podcast host you're an author we'll give uh time at the end and i'll make sure in the show notes people know how to connect with you but i think it's important we said that up front now i want to get your backstory first and please tell it because it is amazing bill gates is involved in it somehow so um please yes. tell us your backstory and how you got to where you are today doing the amazing work that you're now thank, doing thank you so much kenny yes yeah, so i i think i probably am like half of the audience that is listening to your podcast which is i'm the unruly person that just didn't really quite fit in and always wanted to do something a little bit different and i found that the advice that i often got it just didn't didn't really hit the mark for me. And I remember vividly, Kenny, that there was this part where in Germany you do this aptitude test and there's 16 pages of just, you know, multiple choice, crossing, you know, writing down. It's like, are you afraid of heights? No. Do you like being outside? Sure, I do. Are you afraid of carrying gear? No, I'm not. And the test said I should have been a roofer. Now, there's nothing wrong with being a roofer, but it wasn't really exactly a career choice that I I, I wanted. Yeah. And then the and and I wanted to be in the creative arts, yes. and I wanted to be a photographer, jewelry designer, textile designer, something that had a little bit of creativity to it. Yeah. And I was told no, 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 no. Yeah. And so I, I I I forged my way through this. Became a photographer. Stood on a glacier one day, responsible bringing a helicopter with an Audi Quattro to the top of the mountain. I'm like I'm outside. I'm schlepping gear and I'm not afraid of heights. I'm doing exactly what the test that I should be doing. It just was a different interpretation. Yes. And so yes. from there on, um, I became photo editor at Elle magazine, immigrated to the United States because I wanted adventure. And then I was very quickly laid off in a massive recession and had to figure out how to be a business owner with a small child with a six month old baby while I was going through a divorce and then uh, started what I call the decade of bad luck. And the decade of bad luck is littered with massive catastrophes and tragedies from uh, a lawsuit against a key employee who ran her own business without me to September 11th, wiping out my production business in 24 hours. I lost a half a million dollars wow. to, uh, to fires, riots, floods, earthquakes. I mean, it just kept coming. And then finally a tsunami that took out one of my key vendors. I mean, who does this happen to? That's just, it's just nuts. And so I ended up being $135,000 in debt and 
I figured, um, you know, if I, I can't borrow any more money to pay interest on borrowed money, which is a really hor horrific financial strategy. Mm -hmm. And uh, I ran out of money, like plain out ran out of money, money. And I went to Germany to drum up some business, saw my dad. My dad had a stroke. My father did not have a stroke. My father had pancreatic cancer. Oh, wow. And so my father passes away within six weeks. I'm at the funeral in Germany and we just had put him in the ground and my phone rings. It's my office in Los Angeles. And they're telling me that I'm losing the house. Now I'm standing there deep in debt, freaking mm -hmm. out, lost my best friend. I mean, coming through just years and years and years. And I finally fell on my knees and I raised my fist against God. And I said, you know, dude, sorry. I mean, if you have a plan, this would be a really good time to fill me in because it just wasn't, that just, just wasn't normal. You know, I was like, what, what, what is this about? And then I had to surrender to, to, I had done everything, Kenny, I could do. There was nothing else I could do. And then my dad died, right? So there was nothing that I hadn't tried, done, risk I didn't take. I had done it all and I let it go. And I got back to Los Angeles. I get a letter from the White House, the White House, the American White House. Wow. So the president of the United States had received my letter. Of course, he never saw my letter, but some underling intern did. And they forwarded this letter to the Small Business Administration, which set me up for a meeting. I restructured my debt into a 10-year fixed loan, freed up my line of credit, got to break even three months later, became the world leader in my industry 18 months later. Wow. And then the Bill Gates company comes and says, how do you do this? Can you show us? I said, absolutely not. <laughs> You want it, you buy it. And then they said, how much do you want? I said, millions. And they said, fine. <laughs> wow. Wow. That is amazing. What an amazing story. And, and just a turnaround just like that almost. Um, so what, what would be one or two lessons you gained from all that? I mean, it was, it's just an amazing story. Yeah, I think that um, that the... The big thing that knowing what I know now, looking back, can share is that when they always say burn the bridges, well, if you don't burn the bridge or you don't close one door and you're standing in the hallway, you're standing in the middle of a draft. So you have to close one door, close one door in order to open the next door so that you can move to that next level. Mm. Uh, that, that would be one thing. The second mm. thing would be to say that we take failure or mistakes or these kinds of obstacles as a personal affront against us and say, somebody is doing this to us. What we don't understand is that it forges us to become that person we need to be to manage the thing that we need to be managed at that time. If I wouldn't have had all this adversity, if I wouldn't have fought like hell, would I have taken these risks that led me to this opportunity? I mean, who writes a letter to the president of the United States? I mean, it's just insane. But I did it because my ex-mother-in-law was such a nag. She just would not stop. And finally, I wrote the letter just to make her not talk about it anymore. Wow. And that was the thing then that, that changed everything. So the third thing then would be to say the challenges that you have are opportunities in disguise. You just don't understand that this thing is the key. You just think it's a pest. Opportunity often shows up as a, as, a, as a problem. And so now when you look into the challenges that you have and you say, I know it's in there. I know the opportunity has got to be in there. I know the opportunity has got to be in there. You're faring much better. It's the other way around when you go like, oh, gee, here's another thing. And you ignore it. That's when you miss the opportunities. That's what I learned. Yeah, I mean, those those were, uh, it's just great life lessons that you just said there. And um, and, and I love the the analogy of you're still in a draft there, if you don't close both doors. Um, and, and I want to start there because you talk a lot about uh, helping leaders and helping others get unstuck. I see that all the time. And so what are some keys to helping someone get unstuck? First, what's a sign that you are stuck? And then uh, what are some things to get out of that? Uh I like I like the way you're looking at this. So so you're stuck when you are treading water or you're in an infinity loop. So sometimes it gets a little bit better and then something happens and then you fall back down and then it gets a little bit better and something happens, you fall back down. 
if you're in a loop, infinity loop or just a loop, that's when you're stuck because you keep doing the same thing. You have to get very clear about mm -hmm. what you know how to do today can get you only to where you are today. Mm. In order for you to go from today to that next level, you are going to need to get an additional different kind of skill set, mindset, and you have to take different actions. So it's the same thing when people say, I want to lose weight. And then you eat the same way, you exercise a little bit more, and then you're mad that your weight's not changing. Mm -hmm. In order for you to change your weight, you must change at least one thing. Stop drinking, stop eating sugar, you know, work out consistently more so you burn more calories. So whatever that might be. And then you go and you say, in business or in my career, it's the same way. Is if I do the same thing over and over and over again, I will get the same result. I mean, that's just that's just that's just science, right? Mm -hmm. Same in, same out. So then I would say if you feel that you're stuck because you're looping and looping and looping, you're not getting the a promotion, you're not getting the bonus, you're not getting uh, to that next level of position that you want, they're not giving you the responsibility, then you need to go internally and say, who do I need to become for them to see that this person can manage what I want? Mm -hmm. And then you have to become that person first mm -hmm. and demonstrate that. And then you get the opportunity. Because mm -hmm. people always say, well, you know, show me, give me the opportunity. I used to have a manager working for, and the woman that wanted to be a manager working for me, she came in my office and she said to me, Beate, I need you to give me the promotion to manager. And I said, why would I want to do that? And she says, well, because then I can show you what I can do. And I said to her, you need to show me what you can do now so that I can give you the promotion to the manager. Mm -hmm. And she did not. And then after I had left, she was promoted to manager and it was an absolute disaster because she did not want to do the work. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's really, I think, the key mindset is instead of saying like, I can't believe they're doing this to me. Those jerks, that idiot, that my, my, my boss is so mean to me. I can't believe the unfairness is like, well, clearly you haven't demonstrated that you are that person that can handle what they need you to handle with ease and confidence. And they don't have trust in you. So what do you need to do? Who do you need to be to demonstrate that? Yeah, I, I loved all of that. And, I, you know, I, I used to always ask, uh, you know, someone that was aspiring to get promoted, well, you've given me this great business plan. How come you haven't done any of this yet? You know, how come you haven't taken a chance? Go, oh, my manager wouldn't. Come on. Did you ever ask them? You know, I mean, that's such great advice. And And where you are right now is what you know right now. So therefore, you've got to develop yourself and be able to think about where you want to go. I mean, that's absolutely, absolutely golden advice. Um, how do you unlock then? I think you said most of it. How do you unlock? I want to go a little further because you obviously unlocked a lot of hidden opportunities in yourself. How, how do you get to that place where you not only unlock those hidden opportunities in you, but in your business and in your surrounding communities and things like that? I think you first and foremost have to believe that the universe, God, spirit is conspiring for you on your uh, behalf to get you what you want. Yeah. So if I walk through life and I think that is a, consp a conspiracy against me, then that's the result I'm going to create. But if I see the stuff that goes wrong and goes well, and I look at this and and I always have this idea of curiosity that's my my advice it's like why don't you think about it from what is happening here where is the hidden opportunity because there's a law called the law of polarity that means if there's white there must be black because you couldn't d distinguish that there was darkness unless there was light mm -hmm. and you couldn't understand that there was darkness if you didn't see the light so if there is a universal law that rules everything then that must exist on the other side. So if the challenge exists, then the opportunity must exist. So if you start training yourself instead of falling for that classic media, middle, you know, middle, middle America thinking that something is always done to you, which is just that that is the conspiracy in itself. Yeah. 
That yeah. is a conspiracy by by politicians, by people with money, by people with power to keep you exactly where you are so you never have to be a, a threat to them. Mm -hmm. Is you keep complaining, you know, back like in Rome they said uh, games and games and bread. So they, you know, they provided games and bread and then people were happy. If that's what you want, then that's all you're going to get in life. Mm -hmm. But if you say that is not enough for me, I want to go further, you're going to have to really step into a fundamental shift and change in how you look at taking responsibility for what is happening for you in your life. Mm -hmm. And instead of judging, saying, so if I've been just laid off, okay, so yes, that's bad. But have I been laid off perhaps so that somebody's kicking me in the butt because I've been saying for three years, for three years that I need a better job. Mm -hmm. Finally, somebody listened and they helped me out of my, my misery. And now I'm going to have to look for something better. So you can either sit at home, cry, like, see, the world is a bad place. You can say, I created this because I kept saying I need a better job. And then I didn't do anything. And then the decision was made for me. Mm -hmm. So depends on on how you want to interpret that. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's all, you know, I love how you say that the, the world is working for you, not against you. When you come to that place, then then everything, everything shifts. Um, I, I want to talk about it before we started. Uh, we were just chatting a little bit about my audience and there's so much that they face day in and day out. And there's so many things because they face people calling out or disengaged employees and things like that that a lot of things can fall through the cracks. They can get overwhelmed. They can get frustrated. What are some things that you advise them to do to stay out of that you know, frustrated mode and, and be able to still focus despite all the things that might go on around them every day? Yes, that, that, that is a tall order right now because I think everybody's having a whiplash, uh, especially yeah. from, from, from corporate, what's coming down. People are, people need to be laid off. Oh, just kidding. People are the most important thing that we have hired just in case, just kidding. Be off again. Uh, so, so I think that there's been so much disruption and challenges that it all comes down to what do you have control over today? That's it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's a, a day at a time. Sometimes it's an hour at a time. Sometimes it's 10 minutes at a time. Wow. So if you show up at work and three people quit overnight, what can you do right now? So it is that laser focus instead of falling into the rabbit hole and saying, man, you know, here we go again. And I can't believe it. Um, I had a guest on my podcast. He says, why don't you make turn a bad day, not a bad moment? Mm. So you shorten the duration of sulking. So if I say, well, it's been one of those days, is that true? Or maybe it's been, it's been one of those, you know, nine o'clock, nine to 10 o'clock moments when three people called me and told me that they probably don't even call because they're chicken. They probably just send a text message or they're not even show up at all. Right. Uh, because that's where everybody is right now is yeah. this thing, this spineless, spineless creatures everywhere. Yes. So, so what do you have control over? Like, what can you do in that moment? And I think that when you train yourself to actively look for solutions, then then you have you feel like you have more power over it. Who do you know? What can you what can you do in that moment? Otherwise, it just gets it just gets to be too complicated. Mm -hmm. And I would also say that it's not always going to be like this. This is the second advice I would have because we have a tendency to look at today as the rest of our lives. It's really not. Today is just a day in many days. And uh, that's today. That just happened right now. That doesn't mean that it's going to be like this tomorrow. And get out of this catastrophic thinking of the doom and gloom and say, well, you know, that was a little bit challenging right now. So uh, let's roll up the sleeves and let's see what we can do to change it. That's a different attitude versus the, oh man, here we go again. You can't find any good people. People yeah. suck. They're all the worst. Uh, they're all ghosting me. The whole generation is a disaster. They don't like to work hard. If they even show up, they're overpaid. And now you're in the spiral of just doom and, 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 and gloom. I will say that there are good things this generation is bringing, which is work-life balance. 
-hmm. and the the discernment over is what I'm doing actually making me happy perhaps a little bit to 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 a degree that maybe we don't quite understand because we learned you want something roll up your sleeve and sleeves and get it done but then again it allows you to very quickly identify who the people are on your team that you actually want to keep yes yes no doubt I, I loved everything you said there um I, I want to continue on that because um you have one of the best definitions I heard of when it comes to the word strategy and um I heard it I think on one of your podcasts and so would you define strategy and now how does this fit into what you just now talked about well uh the strategy is really the overall idea of where it is that you want to go mm -hmm. because that then th there's two things you need in life to get anywhere you need to know where you are right now that's your starting point and you need to know where you want to go and then we can reverse engineer the strategy to get from here to there I always compare it, Kenny, it's like when we go into the New York subway station mm -hmm. and we are, let's say we're in Midtown and we want to go to the Empire State Building. So what what do we do? We we, we go, we, we look at the red dot that says you are here and then we're going to figure out where we want to go. And then we look, it's like, okay, I could take this train from here to there and then I'm going to have to make a transfer and then I'm going to go there. People maybe not want to be in the metro. They say, well, it's a nice day. Why don't I take a bus? Other people go, it's only 10 blocks. I can walk. So you can get there in a variety of different ways and you get to choose, right? So the destination, however, what's a little bit different in, in the way life really works is that the path, even though you mapped it out, isn't entirely up to you. That's up to a different force because you don't know. So when you are sitting on that bus, the bus could break down. You may have to walk anyway. It could be that there's a massive delay. You thought it was going to take half hour. It takes you an hour. It could be that in subway station, you forgot to get off the train and then you, you know, went and it became a whole disaster or uh, they stopped that train for the day because there's construction. So there's all kinds of things. So now you can't always throw yourself on the ground and throw a temper tantrum, or you can say, I got to keep this overall strategy goal in mind. And that's where I really feel that strategy is so important is what is it that you want? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where do you even want to go? Mm -hmm. Is it enough for you to wake up, go to work? That's it. Or are you seeing yourself at some point owning the restaurant mm -hmm. or being a, fr uh, a franchisee and having, you know, and, 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 and running the store that you're running right now, but just being an owner. So that depends on your objectives of, the clarity with which you pursue your destination. Mm -hmm. And then once I know where you want to go, we can build a strategy around anything because then we know who you need to be to do that. Mm. Wow. Wow. I love that. Leaders, you're getting gold here, man. <laughs> this is fantastic. Um, and especially us in New York, we I, I could so relate to the uh, to the subway thing. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, doesn't something happen every freaking five days with it? Oh with my, with uh, Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, three elements you talk about to become an authority in your field. Why is it important that you're an authority in your field, first of all? And then what are those three elements? What are those things that you advise? So uh, you want to be an authority, not a celebrity and not an influencer. Please don't. Uh, that's always the first distinguish, uh, the, the first uh, differentiation, let me put it this way, that I want to make. An influencer or a celebrity is somebody who spends their entire time of wanting to be admired and then influence people to do certain actions. That's really kind of not what we do. We want to become an authority. An authority is an expert in a particular industry. So you are the best at what you do. So people look at you and say, well, when it comes to when it comes to podcasting on middle management stuff, so I gotta go to Kenny. I gotta, I gotta listen to the podcast leading from the middle because that's where it's at, right? That is an authority. Now, as the authority, you have some influence and you have some sort of celebrity status, but it's not like you're, you know, people photographing you in, in, you know, uh, when you, when you have a Valentino pants fresh off the runway in Milan and running around in New York. I mean, that's just not congruent right. with what you are mm -hmm. and who you are. So there is, there is that piece. And again, you know, when you want to, when you, when you want to be successful, 
You do need to have a strategy. You need to be growth focused and you need to have authority. Mm -hmm. So these three things are really critical. You have to figure out how am I going to be the best in my field so people look at me as an authority. How do I get in front of people? Where do I speak? Where do I participate? How do I network? How do I get my name out? How do I make people notice me? How do I want to grow personally as a, as a as a human being? How do I help where I am growing? Because if you help the company that you where you're working at right now to grow, you will automatically be be seen because people say, "What are you doing?" I remember there was a Shark Tank issue. Uh, no, no, what was it? A um, uh, uh, undercover boss mm -hmm. and. There was one 7-Eleven that apparently outsold in coffee by, by I mean, a ridiculous margin by like 2,000% over any other location. And so he went there and guess what it was? It was one person, yes. one person yes. that stood there every morning and and just chatted and talked and connected. And because she was that ray of sunshine that everybody wanted in the morning, that you know, that was what, what got the attention where somebody says, well, I got to go and see what she's doing. How do we replicate this particular formula? That's authority. That's growth, right? That's a strategy. So those are all three things at once. And that is, I think, what's often misunderstood, Kenny, is that people think if they work for the man, then they have to stick it to the man to some point. Leaders don't think that way. Mm -hmm. Leaders always think about, I'm here, I'm going to give it everything, I'm going to make the best out of it, and my next step after this is learning how to lead even better, mm -hmm. so that these people can perform even better, because when you set this in motion, that's the energy that replicates, that's what gets you the attention, and and so basically what I'm saying, got to get off your butt and do the work. Wow, wow. I love that, and, and I, you know, there's so many things you said that stand out there, but certainly the influencer and celebrity thing, it, you know, we're <laughs> we've become that's become so ingrained in our culture, you know, and and is that really getting the work done? You know, um, so I love that you said that. I'll just say this real, real quick. So that that 7-Eleven is in Shirley, New York. And I oh, live, you know which one it is. I live right down the road. Yes. And so I met. I spent many an early morning getting coffee there. Um, yes, yes, yes. Um, and I know exactly the lady you're talking about. A wonderful, wonderful uh, lady. So, um, and I'm so glad we watched the same thing. Because Undercover Boss, I think, uh, inspired me all the time. Uh, you know, so um, he, here's my last um, regular question. I can't let you go without uh, asking this. Deontay, what would you say would be two or three of the top skills that leaders really, really need today? I think number one is to not take failure personal and to immediately shake it off. Mm -hmm. I compare this, Kenny, like when you know you go in your car and the GPS tells you it needs to be updated and you just ignore it, ignore it, ignore it. And then one day, you know, of course in New York, inevitably there's a construction site, you can't get through. What do you do? You get out of the car, you throw yourself on the ground, you go, I'll never drive again. It's the worst day of my life. I'm such a lousy driver. The world has conspired against me. This is, you know, I, I'll, I'll never, I'll never be able to drive properly. You're not going to do any of that. You're going to go, mm, should have updated the GPS. Yeah. So you wave at the guy with, you know, with the neon sign and the, and the safety stripe. And you say, got it by you turn around, find another way because you know, your destination is still there. So always keep in mind, failure is not personal. Failure is for you an opportunity to find a different way. So that would be the number one thing. The second thing is that when it comes to mindset and when it comes to really clarity and clean thinking, it is a daily, daily objective. Mm -hmm. they, you literally cannot let up one day. If it's between the crime show and a mindset podcast, listen to the mindset podcast. Yeah. If it's between... Um, you know, and I love, I love, I love Jason Bourne and Laura Croft and, you know, catching bad guys and spy movies. It relaxes me for some unknown reason, you know, that's all good, but you still got to do the other work. Yes. So when you, when you get off work, don't leave that behind. Don't leave like these two separate lives. It's one life. It's your life. So make sure that the principles of leadership that you're developing also work in your own personal life with your relationship, with your kids, with your friends and family. 
So I never understood when people say, oh, that's just how I am at work. It's like, what are you like psycho? Are you like a <laughs> dual personality disorder or something? You know, become one person that yeah. is predictable and has one one behavior pattern that everybody can can recognize. That would be my advice. Yes, yes, I love that. I love that. Absolutely. I, and long are the days where you could separate the two. You know, I think maybe my dad's generation, you know, he was different at work than he was at home, but it's just, it doesn't work anymore. It really doesn't. This has been absolutely amazing. Um, what great advice you've given to the audience here and um, and the success that you are passing on to others is phenomenal. So I, I want to ask how people can connect with you and work with you and, and get more of what we just got in this half hour. Yeah, so I do something that's called the unapologetic value proposition, where I help uh, people to really figure out what sets them apart and what's they what's their I call it unapologetic value, uh, so that they can understand on how to become that person. So I have a program for that. If that's interesting, just go ahead and reach out. Go to my website. There's a contact us form or schedule an uncovery session. It's called uncoverysession.com, 15 minutes, and uh, and we'll, we'll talk to you about how we can help you reach your goal. There's my book specifically for women that are working called Happy Woman, Happy World. Um, that's been an award-winning, a best-selling book, just giving a lot of this, how do women that are oftentimes moms and that are working, how do we get ahead? How do we how do we articulate ourselves and how do we make these advancements? I've had plenty of men who read it who called it the playbook of the other team. And uh, you know, just don't be a stranger, reach out. And while we're at it, I want to really encourage everybody who's listening to this podcast, please do us a favor, go to wherever you pick up this podcast and give Kenny a five-star review with a little note and a comment because that's what helps get their rankings up for the show and uh, share like one takeaway you have from this episode and share this particular episode with one other person that needs to hear what we were talking about today. Oh, awesome. Well, thank you so much for saying that. And yeah, absolutely. Um, this has been amazing. I can't thank you enough. You've been so generous with your time. And um, I hope to connect with you again. I think uh, I just scratched the surface a little bit uh, with you, but uh, I'll be ordering that book because um, I have a 28-year-old daughter. Well, I'll read it myself first, but I have a 28-year-old <laughs> daughter I think it's the ideal for. It. She's a retail leader, and um, and she, she definitely is searching for someone like yourself to kind of connect with. So, um, but Beyonce, thank you again. This has been amazing. And so we're going to leave it there, folks. This has been the Leading from the Middle podcast with Kenny and Beate. We will talk to you real soon.